Hi, this is Ron Sipsick, and in this particular segment, we're going to take a look at uh, a very fundamental model used in macroeconomics called the simple circular flow model. In understanding this model, it's first important that we understand the difference between a flow and a stock. A flow is an amount, let me write this out, an amount measured over a period of time. One, one good example of this in macroeconomics is income. So a nation's income, if we were to look at the income of the United States of America, for instance, that is an amount measured over a particular period of time, say 2014. Okay, so we're only interested in the income that is earned within that time period and national income, which is what that's traditionally called, would be a flow because that's an amount measured over a period of time. Whereas a stock, a stock is an amount, let me write this out for you, an amount measured at a point in time. So whereas income, say the income of a particular individual like myself, my annual income is a flow, my wealth, say what I have in a retirement fund, is a stock. Now let me, let me show you how a flow and a stock might be connected. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this down a little bit and uh, I'll show you something here. Um, let's use, as an abbreviation for income, Let's use uh, the symbol Y, okay? So Y equals income. And let's say that we have a number of periods. We have uh, year one. Well, I better use a different symbol for that. Year one, year two, year three, okay? Now, let's say that in year one, let me use a different color here. Let's say that in year one, the income of a person is greater than their consumption. So, in other words, they earn greater income than they spend in that year. C stands, C stands for consumption. Consumption is the amount spent on goods and services. So let's say that the income is greater than consumption in year one, so the person has actually added they've saved. They've actually added to their wealth. Let's say in year two their income is greater than their consumption and they add to their wealth. And let's say that in year three their income is greater their, than their consumption and they add to their wealth. Well this is actually a saving flow. So this is saving. This is what was saved in year one. This is a saving flow in year two, this is a saving flow in year three. The point is, in every year, some of income was saved. Well, when you total that all up, you're going to get the person's total savings. Savings. Now, this seems very, very subtle, but the term savings is actually a stock. The term savings is actually a stock. It represents the amount of savings at a point in time at the end of three years. Whereas saving, the term saving actually refers to a flow. This is the amount that was saved during a particular time period. So there is a connection between flows and stocks. If you save every year out of your income at the end of that time period you look at, say at the end of a year or three year period, five year period, or at the end of your career, you're going to have wealth. This accumulated saving is going to turn out to be a stock of wealth. So it's important to, let me, let me just back up here and um, I'll write this up top here. It's important to to distinguish a flow from a stock. So in our particular example, let me get rid of that bubble there, our example for a flow here, as I said earlier, is income. Income is a flow. It's an amount measured over a period of time. Our example of a stock here is wealth. 
let's say, a savings account or a retirement fund. That's an amount measured at a point in time. Now, obviously, if you save during the year, your savings account, your wealth, is going to go up. So you have a starting wealth figure at the beginning of the year. You have an ending wealth figure at the end of the year. If your wealth went up over the year, it's probably because you saved. Okay, or it's because that wealth has increased in value for other reasons, which we're not going to look at right now. Uh, let me use a non-economic example. Let's say we're talking about blood. How much blood is in your body at a point in time? Well, uh, I've read different numbers, and probably it's a different amount for different people, but I think it averages about six pints, six or seven pints. How much blood flowed through your body over the course of a year. Well, that's a much, 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 much greater number because your body uh, circulates blood. And actually, your blood dies. So your body is creating new blood all the time and replacing blood that is dying. Your body is actually regenerating your blood supply as you move through life. The point is, I have actually read that millions of gallons of blood can flow through a person's body in a period of... Uh, a year or more. So let's say a year you have a million gallons of blood flowing through your body. Well, that is a completely different number than the amount of blood in your body at a point in time. So in our blood example, the stock is much smaller than the corresponding flow, where in our savings account example, the amount saved each year, the flow, is much smaller than the the stock, which is the accumulated wealth. All right, so we need to get used to this idea of a flow versus a stock. Most, uh, most of economic measurement focuses on flows, not on stocks. We're much more interested in what's happening over time than what is happening at a point in time. And that's what you're, you're going to see today when we do the simple circular flow model. Okay, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to build a simple model of the macro economy. In doing so, I'd like to connect the market model to a macroeconomic model called the simple circular flow model. So we're going to identify two basic sectors in the simple circular flow analysis. We're going to uh, identify the business sector and we're going to identify the household sector. We're going to leave government out of the picture. We're going to assume that there is no government involved in economic matters which would be a purely capitalistic system. Now, we're going to assume that businesses sell goods and services. So goods, we'll put the goods slash services on this arrow and that businesses sell those goods and services whereas households buy those goods and services. So really when you begin to teach economics either at the principles level or at the macroeconomics level, uh, principles of macroeconomics or principles of microeconomics, you're going to start with uh, markets usually. You're going to start with some sort of breakdown of buyers and sellers. And m most of economics focuses on the product side, which is goods and services. And of course, in that role, businesses sell and households buy. But you also have an arrow flowing back this way. And we know that households actually supply resources to businesses. So in a market system, for instance, for instance, labor is owned by households. If you work for a restaurant, if you're a student and you work for a restaurant part-time or full-time, then you're actually selling your labor to a restaurant. So as a member of a household, you sell your labor, but the business, the restaurant, actually buys your labor. So this role of buying and selling is reversed. The household is the seller and the business is the buyer. Now, of course, there are other resources. We could talk about land. We could talk about capital. We could also talk about entrepreneurship. But probably the easiest resource to think about in this context is labor. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's go ahead and draw up here a small model of a product market. So you got a price and you have a quantity, and you have a supply curve, 
and you have a demand curve. And who is the supplier of goods and services? Well, the supplier of goods and services will be the business sector. Who is the demander of goods and services? Well, that's the household sector. And of course, there is a, a price for the product, and there is a certain quantity of product traded. Now, what's interesting, if you take price times quantity, if you take the price times quantity, you're going to actually get the total amount spent. You also, if you take the price times the quantity, you get the total amount received by businesses, which is called revenue. So we can actually show that. So I'm going to change the color here. And uh, let's see if I can do this. We're going to draw an, an arrow that comes around like this. Now we're starting to put a, a circular flow in. And what comes out of households? Well, households have to pay for these goods and these services. So what their payment is, is a, it's an expenditure. Total expenditures represent the total amount that households spend on goods and services. And again, if you want to actually calculate the total expenditures for a particular good, it's going to be the price times the quantity equals the total expenditure. Okay, so if the price of, um, let's say the price of a bag of apples, three pound bag of apples is five dollars, and you sell a hundred bags, five times one hundred would be total expenditures of five hundred dollars. Okay, now of course if you're talking about one individual's expenditures, that's a micro question. But if you're talking about the total expenditures of all households in an economy, over a particular period of time, that's a macro question. Okay, so what we're beginning to do is we're beginning to talk about taking markets, which are micro entities, and aggregating them into something that becomes a macro entity. If you take all spending on all output for a particular period of time, say a year, 2014, whatever year it is, you're going to have a nation's total expenditures. Now, total expenditures flow over to the business sector, but we don't call them total expenditures over here. Over here, they're going to be called total revenue. Total revenue. And again, total revenue is, uh, on a micro level, it's price times quantity equals total revenue, TR. And of course, you're going to aggregate that because you're now talking about all businesses, not just one business. You're talking about all businesses. And so this is the total revenue of all businesses in the system, which would be total revenue. Notice that total expenditure and total revenue are both flows. They're measured over a particular period of time. They're not measured at a point in time. They're measured over a particular period of time. Now, let me go ahead and move this up a little bit. And uh, in doing so, we'll be able to do the, the bottom part here of the model. Now, let me, go back to, let me go back to my writing function. And uh, I'm going to go back to the color black. So we'll go back to black. Now, there is also markets for the resources. There are, for instance, labor markets. So you could put a market model down here if you like. And there is a price for labor. We generally call that a wage, but we'll use a P there. And there's a quantity of labor. We generally call that an employment level, but uh, we'll just call it a quantity here. So you can take the supply curve and the demand curve model, and you can apply it to re the resource side. And we can talk about labor markets. Now, the difference is, is that if you're talking about a labor market, the supplier is going to be whom? Members of a household, and the demander in this case will be businesses. So businesses demand labor, households supply labor. And that's pretty much what we intimated up here with the flow. Now, when businesses buy labor, they have to pay for it. And that payment has a name. We're going to call this a total... When businesses pay for labor and other resources, this is going to be called total resource payments. 
my hand hasn't awakened today and uh, my handwriting is pretty crummy. I apologize for that, but um, I, it looks like uh, you can read it. So we'll just keep going here instead of re redoing this. So again, if you take the price of the resource, you know, this could be an hourly wage, and you multiply it by the quantity of the resource, you'd actually get the total amount spent on the resource. So this would be your total resource payment. And again, um, usually when you're talking about labor market theory, you don't use P and Q. You're going to use something like a wage rate W and an employment level. You usually use L for labor here. It's a quantity of labor and an employment level. But just, um, just to sketch this out, we'll use P and Q here. But remember, this is the price, let's say, of labor, and this is the quantity of labor. Okay, so we're not talking about output. We're talking about inputs. Now, notice the four resource payments. Um, there are four resource payments because there are four basic types of labor. Um, for labor, we're going to be including wages here. So you're going to have wages for labor. Wage, a wage is the payment for labor. You're going to have rent as the payment for natural resources or land. You're going to have interest, interest which is the payment for capital, and you're going to have profit, profit, which is the payment for the entrepreneur's services. So these are your four basic types of resource payments. And I, I would hasten to add, quickly add here, that profit is included in these total resource payments. Profit is the residual. It's what's left over after the business pays its other expenses, its wage payments, rent payments, interest payments. But the, the owner has to be paid. If the owner isn't paid, now there could be years when the owner incurs a loss and isn't paid. But if the owner is going to continue to do what the owner does, and that is pull the business together, organize it, be the creative genius behind it, uh, risk uh, his or her personal capital to start the business, if the owner is going to do that, they, they have to expect they're going to generate what is called a profit. Now, resource payments flow out of businesses in payment for resources. Well, what flows in over here, uh, over on this side, is going to be total income. So income is what flows into the household sector. Notice that income could be of four basic types. It could be wage payments, rent payments, interest payments, and profit payments. So there are actually four types of income, just as there are four basic types of resource payments. Okay, And what we see here is the completion of the simple circular flow, that expenditures come around and become revenues, revenues become resource payments, resource payments come around and become income, income is used to make expenditures, and you've closed the loop and you have a circular, circular flow. Notice all of these are flows. All of these are flows. Expenditures, an amount measured over a period of time. Revenue, an amount measured over a period of time. Resource payments, a specific amount measured over a specific period of time. Income, an amount measured over a period of time. So this represents economic activity only within a particular period of time. This is a big deal. This is to be contrasted against an economic variable that is a stock or something that's measured at a point in time. Now let me go ahead and move this, move this up a little bit and I want to just say a little bit more about this model before we we conclude this lesson. Uh, when we develop this model we, we've really made three assumptions. So let me give you the three basic assumptions of simple circular flow. So let's write out our assumptions here. Let me go to a different color. Let me go to blue. So our assumptions, what are our assumptions here? What have we been assuming? Remember, the purpose of assumptions is to simplify. We simplify, we simplify our models using assumptions. We rule certain things out. We only want to talk about certain things. When we assume we uh, are making statements about economic reality and we're making no attempt to prove it. For instance, here, we're assuming no 
saving. We saw no saving in this model. Households spent all of the income they received and businesses paid out all of the revenue as resource payments that they received. So businesses received uh, revenue and they paid those all out as resource payments. They didn't save any of that. Now if we have no saving, we're going to learn that we have no investment. Okay, And we'll be talking more about that later uh, in a later lesson. Actually what we're going to do is we're going to take this simple circular flow and we're going to uh, get rid of these assumptions and we'll turn it into a complex circular flow. But that's a later lesson. Okay, so we have no saving, no investment. We also have no government in this model, which simplifies the model quite a bit. But if we have no government, we have no what? We have no taxes. So you see no taxation in this model. You go, yay, no taxation. I don't have to pay taxes in the world of simple circular flow. Uh, but on the other side, there's lots of government programs and government goods and government services that we miss out on. For instance, I'm a big, I'm a big uh, believer in roads. I travel quite a distance to work. And I like the idea of interstate highways. I really like the idea of that. And I'm sure that in a world where there was no government, there would be some industrious person who would want to try to make a profit building roads and charging for the use of those roads. But um, I really enjoy the idea that government actually has stepped in and taxed road users, usually using gasoline taxes, and paid for beautiful roads. Now, the road I drive on to work is very beautiful. It's well paved. It doesn't have holes in it. In the wintertime, I live in a climate that has something called snow, and the government actually removes that snow from the road, which is very helpful in driving on it in the middle of January. It also salts the road and grades the road, and the, 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 the uh, landscaping around the road is actually very beautiful, so it's, not, it's very beautiful to drive down this highway and see the, the pine trees and all the beautiful trees that have been landscaped. Also, some of the trees have been moved a great distance away from the road, so if you go off the road, you sometimes I'll, I'll, um, I'll fall asleep at the wheel. I don't do it, try to do it too often. It's kind of dangerous. But uh, if I were to go off the road, I wouldn't hit a tree five feet off the road. They've cut the trees back. They've even put little rumble strips on the side of the road, which wakes you up when you start riding on the side of the road. There's all sorts of ingenious things government does to help you get from one city to another. I am thankful for at least some government. Now, some government I, I'm not as crazy about, but uh, I'm not going to even share that with you, what I think is good and what I think is bad. But the point is I'm for some government, which means I have to pay some taxes as well. All right, well, enough of that. Let's keep moving. But in a world, obviously, of no government, there would be lots of things that we like to use that we wouldn't be able to use. Number three, this model also assumes no foreign sector. No foreign sector. So essentially, we're, we're assuming here a closed economy. In other words, this economy uh, only has domestic buyers and only has domestic sellers. So in other words, everything that is produced is produced locally and everything that is purchased is purchased only by local buyers. Okay, now we're going to wrap this lesson up at this point, but I'll set the table for the next lesson on circular flow and what we're going to basically be doing when we develop a complex circular flow model is we'll be relaxing these assumptions. We'll be basically pulling these assumptions off. So as you pull these assumptions off, don't do this to your, your notes, but as we pull these assumptions off, what's going to happen? As we pull them off, eliminate them, we're going to move from what? We're going to move from simple to complex. The trade-off is it's going to get more difficult to understand, but it's going to be closer to reality. All right. Good day.